Hello, everyone. Can we see how many participants we have? We have 44 participants, as I can see. So thank you for joining our session on the ecosystems and um, with applications in ecology and uh, agriculture. As we know, ecosystems such as whole oceans or human gut or human saliva, these are sustained through the microbial communities and of course uh, through the diversity of these communities. Therefore, it's very important um, uh, so that we understand how this diversity changes through time and how um, microorganisms interact within these uh, ecosystems. So better understanding uh, would actually give us the means to sustain this um, ecosystem being healthy and uh, also to manipulate them uh, if we want to achieve certain uh, desired outcomes. We also know that the data uh, that comes from environmental samples are um, not easy to deal with. Uh, it's large, messy, high, highly heterogeneous. Um, so it's really necessary to develop robust bioinformatics approaches uh, uh, and to model, um, um, develop models that capture the evolution uh, and the interaction between microorganisms. So today we have um, five speakers who will um, together give a, a good idea of the latest works uh, that have uh, been um, going this direction at the SIB. Uh, so you can see that topics are very diverse and they reflect a variety of different approaches and applications. So enjoy the session. I uh, pass you to Theo who will introduce the speakers. Hello everyone. Uh, so first we will welcome Lucas Paoli, which, which is a PhD student in the ETH Zurich under the supervision of uh, Shinichi Shinagawa. And he will talk for 12 minutes about global ocean microbiome. And then we'll have uh, uh, the time for one or two questions perhaps. Hello. So thank you for tuning in. Um, as Theo said, my name is uh, Lucas and I'm working as PhD student with Shin Tsunagawa at ETH Zurich. I'll present today how um, metagenomic based genome reconstruction can provide very important insights into a key ecosystem, which is the global ocean microbiome. And I'll focus on uh, one angle, which is the one of natural products and the biosynthetic potential of this ecosystem. So that's an ecosystem that actually covers 70% of our planet, right? As you can see in, in that picture, you have uh, a view of the Pacific Ocean that just shows how prevalent that ecosystem is. And within that surface, of our planet, in each of the single drop of water, we have more than 500,000 microbial cells. Altogether, these cells are actually driving the biogeochemical cycles on our planet with um, the production of most of the oxygen we breathe, for instance. To understand or get a better understanding of that ecosystem, um, one can uh, try to understand the genomic basis of that microbiome, right? So you would, with the traditional approach, um, go to the field, for instance, take a boat, sample, cultivate uh, the, mi uh, the microbial cell you could sample and sequence their DNA. With that, you would get as isolated genomes from different sampling sites, as you can see in, in, in that map, for instance, and having different strains of the same species, you could start doing comparative genomics. However, nowadays, and for the last 10 years, metagenomics have proven extremely useful in sampling the whole community in its natural environment. Here on that map, you can see five of the most important uh, metagenomic surveys of the global ocean microbiome. You have three spatial surveys, including Tara Oceans, Malaspina, and Biogeotraces, as well as two time series, the Hawaiian Ocean time series and Bermuda Atlantic time series. All of that together represents over a thousand metagenomes 
and they capture the natural communities within the ocean microbiome. Right, so integrating these reference genomes derived from isolates with the metagenomes that sample natural communities in situ, you can reach genomes where you actually see the, um, the natural occurrence of your isolate genomes in the communities you want to study. However, the major issue here is that the mapping rates of these metagenomes on the reference genomes is only 10% on average across the whole ocean microbiome. Meaning that for the DNA reads that you have in your metagenomes, you can only map 10% of these to your, your isolates genomes. So you're missing 90% of the genomic content of the community you're trying to study, right? Which is obviously the major fraction of it. And with such a, a, a fraction of the big picture, one only can wonder what, what do they do? What does this 90% of the community does? What's the ecological function? And as I mentioned, what's the biosynthetic potential? Meaning what's the, the, the secondary metabolism within uh, these, these organisms that we don't know anything about in terms of um, what are the chemicals they use to communicate between themselves or uh, to, uh, um, to, to defend themselves against viruses or uh, to, uh, at, um, to, to attack themselves through uh, antimicrobial, for instance. And this is particularly interesting in, in the midst of a, uh, a viral pandemic, for instance, having a, a good knowledge of the biosynthetic potential of the different microbiomes um, can lead to the development of antivirals, antimicrobials, which um, are under big pressure at the moment with, uh, with the, the antimicrobial crisis. Right, but again, how do we get their genomes, right? So, I'll start by walking you through a um, reconstruction pipelines for reconstructing genomes from metagenomes. I'll just try to highlight one specific point on which I think uh, we just uh, need to focus a little bit and then move on to the results, right? So you would start with metagenomic process reads from all your samples. In our case, it's about a thousand metagenomes. You assemble these genomes, the metagenomes, sorry, and to get genomic scaffolds for all your metagenomes. Once that step is done, you can backmap your metagenomic reads to your metagenomic assemblies. And here is where I want to, uh, to, to focus a little bit. We backmap all the metagenomic reads from a data set to all the assemblies in that data set, right? And that enables differential abundance binning, meaning that you can see whether the scaffold I has a correlated abundance with the scaffold J and therefore group them together. That's, for instance, the case displayed here. However, in another case, the abundances can be completely basically random with no signal, and that's a case where you do not want these two scaffolds to end up together in a bin. Based on differential coverage and tetranucleotide frequencies, the genomic scaffolds can be grouped together. Obviously, within these different groups, you will have uh, things looking like proper genomes, uh, other genomic elements, or just random pieces put together. So you need to filter based on uh, marker genes to only select um, uh, good quality uh, candidate genomes. Then there is a derivation step. Obviously, there is redundancy in the data set with over a thousand metagenomes, and these different uh, metagenome, metagenome assembled genomes are derivated based on nucleotide identity to identify species level clusters. All these genomes, and not only the derivated ones, are subsequently annotated functionally, taxonomically and um, looking as well for uh, mobile genetic elements. So I insisted on the different current binning. And I did so because here on that figure, we can show that using large scale differential coverage improves the binning results threefold. Right? So here that figure displays the ratio of cumulative quality scores of binning results of metagenomes. On one hand, you have um, quality scores of binning efforts with differential coverage divided by the binning efforts without differential coverage. And this quality score captures both the number of mags recovered, number of genomes recovered, and their quality. And you see that um, on all the data sets that we have, using differential coverage across 180, 190, 58, and 610 metagenomes improves the quality of the binning efforts on average almost three folds, which which is a lot. Um, 
All right, so that's why I really wanted to insist on that. Then, so we applied uh, the pipeline I described to the 1,000 metagenomes and recovered 26,000 uh, genomes from these 1,000 metagenomes. This, these 26,000 mags could be grouped into 5,000 species. And despite previous efforts of reconstruction of this specific ecosystem, we still find a lot of phylogenomic diversity. As you can see on this figure, a third of the species are known, but a third of them are unknown species from known genera, and another third are completely novel taxa. We are not the only ones. Uh, pursuing such efforts to access the 90% of the uncultivated fraction of the global ocean microbiome. So we integrated our, uh, our reconstruction efforts with other, uh, other people reconstruction efforts as well. So we include manually created mags from um, Delmont uh, and colleagues, the single uh, cell amplified genomes from Ramona Stepanakas, as well as reference genomes from isolates um, using the MAR database. Overall, we end up with 35,000 genomes, and we can um, display how they are uh, distributed across the tree of life or the tree of bacteria and archaea, at least. In gray, you see the genome taxonomy database tree backbone, and we overlay the 35,000 genomes with phylogenomic placements in that tree. A darker blue indicates a higher number of genomes in that specific part of the tree. We can then see how the different type of efforts capture the different uh, parts of the tree. And we see that the mags are actually the ones capturing most of the phylogenetic diversity, although we see a very strong complementarity between the SAGs and the mags, with the SAGs capturing clades such as beta gibacteris much better. Then, as I mentioned, uh, we want to focus on the biosynthetic potential of that ocean microbiome and that uh, of these genomes in the ocean microbiome. So that's this outer layer where you see the number and the type of biosynthetic gene clusters within the genomes that we have. You see right away that uh, actinobacteria stand out, and that's quite expected because that's where streptomyces is, and that's the bacterium from which we actually derive most of the antibiotics we have right now. But something else is striking, and what's striking is that clade here highlighted with a red arrow. It's uh, a, a, a mag within the Eremiobacter rota phylum that is completely uncharacterized and has a completely unsuspected biosynthetic potential. That's what we see here as well, with the top 10 uh, most talented in terms of biosynthetic clusters, bacterial species that we reconstruct in the data set, and its unknown uh, species from the Eremiobacter rota phylum is the one with the highest number of biosynthetic gene clusters, so the highest number of natural products encoded in the genomes. Here, we can see a quick snapshot of all these products. It's very diverse. It includes a wide range of potentially active compounds, but I want to focus uh, specifically and draw your attention to three of them, which are proteusins, and this, uh, these are a recently characterized family of potent antimicrobials and antivirals. And uh, interestingly, for instance, the, the, the cluster at the bottom shows, a, shows homology and synteny um, similarity to a very recently characterized protein cluster that shows act, um, uh, activity against um, uh, uh, adenoviruses such as the Margot virus. So uh, very critical diseases. So why don't we know about it, right? It, it seems to be particularly interesting and uh, have a very interesting potential both for, for the ecology of the ecosystem and the natural products community. Well, we don't know about it potentially because it's a very poorly known candidate phylum with only a few mags represent it, uh, representing it, right? So this is another view of the GTDB tree where you see how uh, the Eremiobacteriota phylum is placed. And if we look at the other mags in that phylum, we see that they really don't have the similar biosynthetic potential that the mags compared to the mags that we reconstruct in our study. So there is a large difference between the two, uh, between the, the, the picture of what we know in the phylum and what we reconstruct here. And finally, an explanation as to why we have no knowledge of that biosynthetic potential in that specific phylogenomic um, uh, uh, um, area is because that bacterium was reconstructed in a very challenging environment. The mags reconstruct, are reconstructed from samples that are below 4,000 meter, meters depth. 
in the Pacific and uh, North Atlantic Ocean, which is actually quite challenging, right, to actually go there, sample, and even more isolate from these environments. With that, I would like to thank everyone for your attention. I would also like to thank everyone in the, in the Sunagawa lab, the students that work with me, and I would like to thank Jörn Peel at the Institute of Microbiology of ETH and Serena Robinson at the University of Minnesota that are working with us on the experimental characterization of, of the various synthetic gene clusters I just presented today. Finally, I have a, a poster today at 3.30 to uh, maybe dive more into all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, I think we have the time for like one, que one question before coming to the next talk. So I'm, I will like take the most important one from uh, Mose Mani, which asks, uh, which uh, programs or strategy did you see, uh, did you use to infer the function of genes? Uh, as a, an example, on Chavaral or something like that. So for the, the, the secondary metabolites, we use anti-smash, a tool developed uh, in, um, uh, by Manix Medemas lab uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so specialized in the prediction of virus synthetic gene clusters um, using the, 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 different, the, the location of different genes um, on genomic context to predict uh, the, the type of uh, natural products encoded by by that uh, cluster, I think was it direct, especially for the for the antiviral and things like that, or in general in terms of the functionality. Well, antiviral was an example, but I guess it was rather a general question. Okay, and we complement that with uh, keg annotations. We use also as a uh, general annotation pipeline and uh, economic. So we have different sources uh, and we can complement the, the anti-smash prediction with external annotation to confirm or um, complement these predictions. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, we are going to the, to the next talk now, uh, which will be given by uh, Carlos Peña from the CI4CB in Yverdon-les-Bains. Uh, Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, all will be okay. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you are not looking. You are only having the single screen because I have some other things on my screen. Okay, if not, just let me know. Um, I'm going to speak today about the Maldives project, which is uh, for machine learning diagnostic soil, but it's in, in Switzerland, not so far. So uh, this is a collaboration mainly between uh, the Shenzhen uh, Wine School, the School on Enology, and our, our school, the HIGVD. Uh, CI4CB is my group, uh, Computational Intelligence for Computational Biology. So, uh, the, idea, the idea is that vineyard soils are affected by several stress sources. So, um, we would like to have an indication of whether that's the, the case uh, in an easy way. And we need to monitor uh, this, uh, the soil quality. Uh, the hypothesis is that protists could be a good um, a source of uh, possible indication of, of that stress because they are quite diverse, they are very abundant, and they are very sensitive to the environmental conditions. So uh, these uh, protists have been successfully used for water by indication, uh, but for the moment they have been rarely used uh, for soil ecosystems. So, our pro uh, goal in the project is to mix microbiomics data, molecular data, with machine learning, so as to have a tool that could uh, could could serve as a diagnostic uh, for the soil quality. That's that's the method. Um, 
we are interested in several environmental factors. So what kind of factors could affect the presence of uh, this protest? And for that, we have data from uh, real or actual vineyards in Valais. And uh, on this basis, uh, what our partners in Changjian have, have done is to produce metabarcoding data from uh, samples taken from the soils. And after we have the sequences and the beta barcoding, we can do different kinds of analysis. And I'm going to present one of these analyses. So as I mentioned, the meta barcoding part, all this, uh, uh, the, the bioinformatics related with that is uh, done by our partners in Changjian. And uh, that's not the subject of uh, the presentation today. Uh, but we are interested is mainly on uh, the soils. We have two sampling years, 2015 and 16, uh, with uh, a number of samples, and uh, they were able to quantify uh, more than 1,000 taxa. It's not exactly species, but well, you know that better than me. And from this data, the idea is how far can we predict the presence of uh, these uh, environmental stress uh, sources based on the abundance of uh, different uh, protests. So as I mentioned, usually these factors have an effect on protests and these protests are um, affected by that. And we think that the abundance of this uh, protest will be an indication of uh, these uh, stress sources for us. So what we are predicting is based on the quantification of protest, how far we can identify uh, the different stress factors. Uh, just to continue, uh, if we, inter we are only looking, for example, at copper, uh, we can see that is this possible to predict with a relatively good uh, accuracy, 80%, more than 80%, the presence of copper of high levels of, of, of copper. So um, that's already a good sign. We tested here three different methods. We have tested other methods, but that's a good indication, but we are not actually going to quantify copper based on uh, this um, uh, protest because copper is quite easy to measure, but it's just to show that it is possible to infer the amount of copper based on this uh, kind of indicators. If we can mix that prediction with, uh, with the power to measure other environmental uh, sources, we can see that it is possible for some of them with a relatively high accuracy, 81% for uh, plant coverage, 80% for organic matter, or even 72% uh, for pH or the percentage of water, different environmental conditions that could be um, representative of the health or the, the state of, of the soil. So if we can mix all these predictions, we could have a better picture of the stress based only on the quantification of these samples. So that's uh, the idea uh, behind our project. And uh, what we have done, that this is done with one method, Cubis, but we have been trying different machine learning methods and finding which, one, which are the best adapted. We would like to go even farther with some other uh, environmental conditions because for example, the basal respiration of the, of, of the microbial uh, world is quite, uh, the predictive value is quite low, relatively low. So we would like to see if it's possible to infer more uh, information. Just uh, to be clear, these values are predicted on 2016, but the models were trained on 2015. So we can see that from one year to another, we can have a relatively good prediction. Uh, at the end, we will try to have uh, much more data for a longer time, so as the models are more predictive and capturing a better um, indications. Okay, uh, I think that's 
uh, what I have to say. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we have shown that the protist communities, given that they respond to different environmental conditions, uh, they can be combined with machine learning models to predict uh, if a given soil is subject to stress factors and different um, possible uh, sources of stress. And that's uh, what we are investigating just now and uh, that opens a lot of uh, new uh, questions. Next step uh, will be to perform uh, what we call feature selection to identify which of these um, uh, protists are the best uh, predictors instead of using the, uh, the more than 1000 if we can use only 100 200 of them to predict all these conditions that will be uh, something uh, much better from a practical point of view and uh, that's all for today thank you very much for your attention and uh, i hope we will have time for questions just now or at the end during the q and uh, final so i uh, stop my chairing and uh, thank you everyone thank you carlos uh, i think indeed we have the time for a small question and i just i just received one i think so it's a question from uh, emmanuel boutet which asks uh, if you also consider the advantage composition of the soil because apparently various roots um i lost it right because various, various roots exudate yeah, may strongly influence microorganisms community. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, the, all the biological questions are more in the, in the side of our Chang'an partners, and unfortunately they were not able to, to be here. And um, I think that uh, in general, uh, we cannot completely separate the environmental sources of other possible sources of, of variation. And uh, the only way to filter out uh, or to consider all these effects would be to have uh, actual information on that so as to build the models aware of uh, that uh, existence, of th th those factors. I mean, the models are not uh, magically filtering out uh, these kind of uh, perturbations and we need to assess uh, whether uh, they, they are present or not. Thanks. Thank you, Emmanuel. We'll be heading to our next talk from uh, Joao Matias Rodriguez, which is a postdoc in the University of Zurich he, under the supervision of uh, Christian von Meering. And he, was talk, he will talk about the Microbe Atlas project dataset. Thank you, Theo. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just setting up the talk. Yeah, so I'll uh, talk about the micro, micro Atlas project. Uh, unfortunately, I won't go into the new insights because that's uh, still work in progress. Um, so I'm sure everybody of you is uh, familiar with the usual microbe analysis. You collect your samples, uh, isolate DNA sequence, and in the end, you'll get uh, the raw sequence data, which uh, if you're interested in the composition of the microbial community, uh, you can perform 16S analysis and obtain a set of OTU representatives, um, and in the end, the OTU counts and uh, taxonomic annotation when that's available. Um, when you go further, you can uh, make your uh, stacked bar charts for each of your samples, uh, in which each color represents a fraction of a certain microbial species, for example. And I'm going to assume that at this point, you want to know what is the species doing in my sample or in my set of samples? Does it shape or is shaped by the environment? Um, what are the prevalent, prevalent and typical microbial to use? And, and for this, you actually have to then compare your samples to another set of reference or you know, to establish what's the baseline. Um, you can also then perform um, the PCOA analysis to identify clusters of, you know, are there differences between the samples, uh, the sample groups? Uh, in my study or not. Uh, but this is all for trying to understand what makes the differences between these groups of samples. How does my uh, sample group differ uh, between sample, uh, the reference sample, for example, or the different conditions. So if you 
between these uh, conditions, you do, for example, differential abundant analysis, and then you get a list of the top most different uh, taxa or species between the, the different conditions. And this is where the kind of the problems and the, the real interesting part starts. Um, but so, for example, you might to kind of uh, have an idea of what uh, is uh, a certain species doing in your sample, you might try to understand that by investigating its function. And for that, you would look up the, in the literature what is the you know, reported function of the species. The problem is that this is not possible for the vast majority of, of taxa since they're actually unclassified, they're not isolated as well. And to illustrate how big the knowledge gap is, uh, if you take the 16 S's of uh, cultural collection strains uh, and you cluster them at what would be the um, species level, uh, into species level to use which is 97% identity, you get around 800 uh, species. So a lot of the strains actually are belong in the same species. Uh, taxon. Um, if you now take, you know, the high quality sequence genomes, uh, these are 20 to 40,000 right now, uh, and you cluster those, they're kind of double uh, that. And as also uh, Lucas and uh, Silas said today, I mean, you get around 5,000 uh, more uh, genome. Um, and, um, but they most of the times, they, so 5,000 more species. Um, but if you then take the most comprehensive census uh, of 16S, uh, that's 150,000, and you cluster them, you get 150,000 species level OTUs. Um, and so just to kind of, you can see that the proportion of what is known, what you can actually use for experiments, which are the cultural collection strains, what you can actually have the information of genomes is still like 2% of the most comprehensive uh, data set that we have currently. And this is of course, a very small uh, um, fraction of the real uh, uh, diversity of microbial species out there. Uh, so the question is how can you actually uh, speed up the research into microbial uh, knowledge? And so one clear thing is we can use metagenomic sequence data. So there's, uh, as of January 2020, there's around 3 million uh, sequence samples. Um, and I mean, this covers a very high, uh, they're very geographically diverse as well as environmental. I mean, we have a specific uh, interest in, in animal gut. Um, but using this information, we could actually start building uh, some information about the unknown taxa, where are they usually present, and then even establish other things of like the, what relations do, are they usually found with some specific microbes, like the ecological relations between them. Uh, the problem is, uh, until now, most of the studies usually concentrate on analyzing um, the samples uh, independently. So you have studies that concentrate on, on plant microbes, on soil, on, on gut or fecal samples, uh, but they've generally been uh, studied in isolation. And of course, there's a lot of challenges as well because uh, different studies target different RNA, uh, so ribosomal RNA regions, they use different types of sequencing approaches. And to compare this, uh, um, the studies, the results into the studies would be quite cumbersome. You might not even know that a certain study would have found some microbe that you are interested in unless you download that raw sequence data analysis yourself. Uh, so there's also metadata heterogeneity, there's a lot, large amounts of data. And of course, also statistical issues uh, pertinent to this uh, data sets. So we've been, uh, for the last 10 years, we've been working on developing tools uh, to, to be able to uh, analyze all of this data. So this, uh, yeah, so several of uh, HPC class, MapSeq are used just for the 16S analysis and the uh, Yanko who's uh, also in the group uh, developed FlashWeave for identifying interactions in this kind of data. Um, so also, so we already uh, performed this analysis. We already analyzed half of the data. We're currently, so that's up to 2019. We're currently analyzing the, the rest of the data from last year. Um, but of course, nothing, uh, this data is quite large. So to allow researchers to very quickly and easily uh, browse and uh, research and compare their data to this, uh, we developed, uh, so Gregor was uh, developing this website, Michael Atlas. Um, and uh, so just to illustrate how, how useful it is, you can now just take your 16S sequence, 
you know, just like in, in Blast, you would paste the sequence. And uh, so this will search uh, from our uh, close reference of 1.5 million sequences and basically immediately, so it's in, in a third of a second, you would get all of the um, samples in which this uh, microbial taxa had been found in. So out of the almost 3 million uh, sequences, sequ microbial samples we've analyzed so far, and you get all of this information without even having a taxonomic uh, uh, classification for your species. So even for the vast majority of unknown uh, species, you can actually get some ecological information. Um, so you get all the IDs from NSVI SRA data sets, including the abundances. You can download this information. You get a pie chart of the samples in which this microbial text was found in, the abundance, the density plot of abundances. Um, you can also submit your own uh, sequence data. So if you, for example, did all the analysis and already have OT representatives, uh, you can simply submit uh, OT representatives and accounts, or you can just submit your raw sequence data. And we will do that, like it takes a couple of minutes to actually get your, uh, your results back and you'll get a profile, a plot of, uh, of your sample, the composition including the OTUs that we use as well, so that this is directly comparable to the data that is in our database as well. Um, and more interestingly as well, you get which are the samples that we have already analyzed, which are most similar to your, um, uh, to your samples, such that then you can download them, then use them for, as a reference, for example, to compare your, your data to and to find out what is different between my uh, microbial samples and the ones that have been historically already analyzed and, and published as well. So yeah, again, you can provide your, your own reference sample group or use one of the available ones. And of course, we will give you the p-value in the difference between in differential abundance test. So with that, I would like to finish and uh, thank uh, everybody that was involved in this project, Christian for being a great boss, and Gregory, Yankon, Maria, Sebastian, Melissa, and the rest of Maring Lab and the SRB days organizers which I'm sure had a lot of work uh, setting everything up and uh, you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Um, I'm not sure we have like a new question that arrived yet. Yes, there is one from Elena Montenegro Borbola. Have you tried oh, yes, Amplicon sequence variants instead of OTU? Uh, I guess the sequence variants are probably the 100% identity. Um, so 100% identity over a certain, for example, region does not guarantee that the full sequence is 100% identical. We actually, in the database, we consider the different levels of OTUs from 99% up to 90%, so 99, 98, 99, 97, 96, uh, and 90. So you can actually look at the data at all these levels. We haven't done 100%, but that could be also easily done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for all of those uh, interesting and uh, diverse talks. And uh, now uh, it will be time to uh, switch uh, to switch meetings and go to the meet the speakers uh, to meet the speakers sessions where we will like all be able to talk with each other. Uh, so I invite you to uh, click on the link that is on the, the website, uh, the SIB website to, uh, to, to go in, in that room and meet all together.